I'm here to talk about cognates again, but this time not cognates at the Germanic level, but at the Indo-European level, uh, sort of a level deeper. Um, I'll start with English and German, just to sort of set the scene. Um, so you might well know that English and German have a lot of vocabulary that, um, not necessarily in common, but they have vocabulary where a word in English is cognate with a word in German. Now this isn't because English has borrowed a lot of words from German. English has actually borrowed very, very few words from German. At least the, you know, the, the common sort of English that most of us speak. Um, but a lot of words are cognate between the two languages because of their shared ancestry. Because they both come from a common ancestor, a sort of grandparent language. They are cousins in a sense. And many words between English and German are cousins of one another. So I'll start by comparing the English word water and the German word Wasser. The original word, which was used around 2,000 years ago and earlier, was Wador. As groups of speakers moved to England, aspects of the vowel changed. The A became more fronted as a result of anglo frisian brightening, and the Old English word is Water. Later changes in some English dialects meant that the first vowel was lengthened and backed again, the vowel in the unstressed syllable was weakened, and at least in my accent, the R disappeared in words where it doesn't have a vowel after it. This is called uh, non-roticity. So, for example, when I say car, I don't say a R sound at the end, I just say k -ar, car. <clears throat> uh, and when I say water, I don't say water, I say water. So now I, I say water. Meanwhile, in mainland Europe, the original word Wator was subject to the high German consonant shift. The T went through a process called lenition, where it became steadily more fricative. So a T sound is plosive. You store up air and then you release it with your tongue in a certain place. T, T. Um, but a fricative sound, you don't store up the air, you release it. Uh, um, and it sort of makes friction with the place of articulation and the tongue. S. So... Uh, Wator became something like Wasar. The W became a V, and like in my dialect of English, the R disappeared unless there was a vowel after it, leading to the modern word Vasa. You could argue that in essence they're the same word, just with two very, very different regional accents. <clears throat> and you can extend this further. Both German and English are descended from Proto-Indo-European, a language spoken something like 4,000 years ago. It was never written down, but we know that it must have existed because of the nature of its descendants today. Most of the languages across Europe and many across the Indian subcontinent have such strong, consistent sound correspondences with each other that they must be a result of the languages being genetically related. Not just languages borrowing words from each other, but descent from a sing single common ancestor. Among others, Latin is also descended from Proto-Indo-European, which means you get plenty of words that are cognate between Latin and English. Not borrowed from Latin, but sharing a common ancestor. Obviously, you do get borrowings from Latin, plenty of borrowings, but um, there are also words which just share a common ancestor with Latin. Uh, Latin hasn't borrowed them from English, and English hasn't borrowed them from Latin. Now, when pronouncing Proto-Indo-European words, it's important to note that it's a reconstructed language, so the exact vowel qualities aren't completely clear. It works like a kind of algebra. Um, there's an argument about exactly how the laryngeal sounds were pronounced, and the way I say them here is based on a few scholarly interpretations, not necessarily the accurate pronunciation of the original word. <coughs> One example is the Proto-Indo-European word regros, which meant something like field. Over a couple of thousand years, this word developed into the Proto-Italic word agros, meaning, again, field, which developed into the Latin word ager, field or farm. The genitive singular of this word is agri, which was loaned to English in the modern word agriculture. So again, this is a loan to English. However, go back to the Proto-Indo-European word regros, and you'll find that in the Germanic languages it progressed differently. Regros became akras, which with anglo frisian brightening on the initial vowel became Old English aker. A vowel lengthening and backing in Middle English turned this into aker, or aker, depending on when you think the rhotic consonant changed, probably depending on where you were. And the great vowel shift took this to aker. A few finishing touches on the vowels take this to the modern English, at least in my accent, aker, as in the measurement of land. 
But here's a spicy one for you. The Proto-Indo-European word go, meaning to pour. It had a variant, gotis, which went on to become the Latin futis, which meant jug. You can see the connection in meaning. Now this was related to the Latin adjective futilis, which meant leaky. Now this was loaned into English where its meaning broadened slightly and took it to the modern English futile. But if you go back to the Proto-Indo-European root go, it had the adjectival variant gutos, gutos, poured or mentioned, invoked. A liquid that had been poured could be said to be gutos. At some point between Proto-Indo-European and Proto-Germanic, this must have acquired religious connotations because in Proto-Germanic it had become roudin, roudin, an invoked person, an invoked one. This became roudin, which became rod, which became god, which became god. This might sound like a huge amount of extrapolation from not very much, but as I've said many times before, sound change is extremely systematic. What I've not included here is the framework of other Indo-European cognates that fill in the puzzle even more. This is genuinely the course of events that makes the most sense. It relies on extremely regular sound changes. For these words not to be cognate with each other would be a pretty big coincidence. Obviously the exact way the meaning changed is all just made up but we know the word meant to pour in Latin. All its cognates in the Germanic languages give us a pretty good, clear idea of what it meant in Proto-Germanic. Other cognates from ancient Greek and Persian also have meanings like to pour or libation. The Sanskrit cognate means a sacrifice in offering to a god. The original meaning then was probably to pour, possibly with a religious connotation. It might give us a tantalising hint that the original Indo-Europeans considered pouring to be associated with religious activity, or it might just be that early Sanskrit speakers and early Germanic speakers both made this association independently, and that part was just a coincidence. As you can see, reconstructing meaning is rather more subjective, but these two words must be cognate with each other. But hopefully this gives you some sort of idea of the sorts of historical connections that historical linguistics can actually reveal. For a long time, Proto-Indo-European, because it was a reconstructed language, sort of hung in the ether, you know. It must have been spoken, because if you triangulate back the modern Indo-European languages and the written down ancient Indo-European languages, there must have been an original, there must have been a, a, a parent language, a great-great-grandparent language. Um, but nobody quite knew who spoke this language. Um, the more recent, well, it's not that recent, but the recent-ish Kurgan hypothesis which has more recently been backed up by genetic evidence, suggests that the culture, the archaeological culture that we can identify with the Proto-Indo-European language is the pit grave culture, which was practised just north of the Black Sea. Now, this is fascinating because this is a, a sort of late Chalcolithic, early Bronze Age culture, which otherwise had only been known through archaeology and through material culture, that we're able to determine certain things about, or gain clues about, their, their sort of way of thinking, not through material culture, but through their language, which we can only reconstruct from the modern descendants of that language. It, it's, it's fascinating that the way we all speak to each other can tell us about how these people thought about things. You know, this is a culture that's only otherwise known through archaeological remains. It's, it's just... I, it's, it's one of the things I really like about historical linguistics is that you can sometimes just find little gems that you, you just wouldn't be able to draw out of archaeology but which make perfect sense when you actually think about them. Um, for example, the thing about pouring possibly having religious connotations in the pit grave culture, you wouldn't know that from, uh, from archaeological remains but linguistic remains, well, remains, I don't know, it's just very, very interesting, I find it very interesting. Thank you for watching this video. I should be able to make more uh, now that I'm back home for a little while. I've got a few planned. Um, but yes, thank you very much. I'll see you soon.